Good evening, everyone. I'm Dr. Patricia Villa from the Philippines, and I'd like to thank the organizers for inviting me to give a talk in this um, symposium. My topic for today will be management of refractive accommodative isotropia. And um, sorry, there. Just for some formalities, I have no financial interest in any of the products that will be mentioned in this lecture. So as mentioned earlier by Dr. Fetty, I'll just again redefine what accommodative isotropy is all about. It is a convergent deviation of the ice associated with the activation of the accommodation reflexes. And there are three kinds. We have the refractive accommodative isotropia, the partially accommodative isotropia, or the decompensated type, and the non-refractive or the high ACA ratio type of accommodative isotropia. But then for tonight, I'll just be discussing on the refractive accommodative isotropia. So just a quick review, what exactly is accommodation? This is actually a process by which the eye changes optical power to maintain a clear image on an object as its distance changes. So there is a reduction in the zonular tension induced by the ciliary muscle contraction, allowing the lens to round up and increase optical power. So when looking at a very near object, light rays from close objects diverge and require more refraction for focusing. So this is just a table that shows you the fusional vergence amplitude and the accommodative amplitudes that the eyes are capable of. And if you notice that the divergence fusional amplitude is much lesser compared to the convergence fusional amplitude. And as we get older, the accommodative amplitude becomes less and less. So what is refractive accommodative isotropia? As we are all familiar with, the onset is usually between six months to seven years of age and at the average age of 2.5 years. So they come to you at around this age, around two years old, three years old. And the, page, the parents would usually um, say or um, notice or observe that it, it starts intermittently. And as the child gets older, it becomes more constant. In terms of predisposition, it's either hereditary, genetic, and it's commonly associated with amblyopia because of the high hyperopic uh, changes in the lenses. And also, if there's a big difference between the right and the left eye, when the difference between the grade of the two eyes are, are wide apart, then this, is also, uh, this can also lead to amblyopia. Um, patients with refractive accommodative isotropia are of high hypermetropes, um, where in their grade ranges from plus two to plus seven with an average of 4.75 diopters. And isotropia is usually around 20 to 40 prism, uh, prism diopters, and the ACA ratio is normal. So in the process of accommodative isotropia, what happens? So when the uh, hyperopia is uncorrected, the, accommodate, the eyes tend to accommodate excessively just to make the image clearer. And this will stimulate overconvergence, straining the fusional divergence later on, which will eventually lead to the crossing of the eye. So now the relationship between hyperopia and isotropia are as follows. There's an increasing hyperopia before the onset of isotropia. And um, hyperopic children with accommodative isotropia is stable. And sometimes the grade just increases up to seven years of age. And later, as they get older, after seven, eight years old, the grade slowly goes down, which we, we all know as the myopic shift. So how do we approach accommodate, accommodative isotropia? We give the full hyperopic correction with the cycloplegic refraction. We check the alignment after one to two months when we get, once we give the spectacles. And we also need to check for the visual acuity, the stereopsis, the, the binocularity. And again, check alignment, check whether there is a remaining or a residual isotropia. If there's a residual isotropia, then we need to repeat the cycloplegic refraction and ask the patient to come back again with the new spectacles. Once on follow-up, check whether there's still the presence of isotropia. If there's isotropia for distance and near, then the patient has partially accommodative isotropia. But then if the isotropia 
is um, absent or the distance alignment is acceptable and the near deviation remains high, then the patient has a high ACA ratio. But if there is no isotropia, once the spectacles are given, then the patient has full refractive accommodative isotropia. So what about ACA ratio? This, this gives a relationship between the amount of convergence, which is the interning of the eyes, that is generated by a given amount of accommodation, which is the focusing effort. So for eyes to maintain fusion or binocularity, there has to be a balance between the central innervation controls for accommodation and convergence. Normal ACA ratio is around four to five is to one, and the imbalance leads to an abnormal ACA ratio. In patients with refractive accommodative isotropia, their ACA ratio is usually normal. These are patients who are high hypermetropics, and the isotropia is restored fully once the full hypermetropic correction is given at all fixation distances, whether near or far. And this is because it reduces the load of accommodation to clear retinal image, which will help align the eye once the spectacles are worn. So here's just a video on a patient without spectacles with a very high hyperopia of plus seven in both eyes. You can see that the eyes are deviating inwards as we do the alternate prism, uh, alternate covered test. Then now with full correction, with a full cycloplegic correction, the eyes are quite straight, orthotropic. There. So for the management, management is we give full cycloplegic hyperopic correction because as I mentioned earlier, it reduces the load of accommodation to clear retinal image, which will help align the eyes. So how do we instill cycloplegic agents? We get the full amount of hyperopia by either installing cyclopentylate or atropine. But I come from the Philippines and I deal with a lot of um, darkly pigmented irises. So my, 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 my choice of eye drop is atropine 1%. I put the drop twice a day for three days. Then I do the refraction on the fourth day. I also make sure that the patient does not have amblyopia once the spectacles are on, because if there's amblyopia present, we need to do amblyopia therapy. And it's important also as well to also remind the parents that the child needs to wear the glasses full time. No breaks in between, only during when they're taking their shower or when they're asleep. So what is the outcome in refractive accommodative isotropia? The outcome is quite good actually, and in terms of vision and binocular single vision. And there was a study that showed that sustained reduction of amblyopia was from 61.2%. It went down to 15.2% with the correction and binocular ocular function improved in 89.3% of, of the patient in one study. And, in a study um, published by WIC, around 90% improved binocular ocular function. Final stereopsis was compared with age of presentation and age at which motor alignment was achieved. It was found out that there were higher levels of stereopsis in those who had later presentation and higher grade of binocular vision is associated with late presentation rather than early de detection and treatment. Now for the stereopsis in patients with refractive accommodative isotropia, um, those in a study published by Heng in JPOS in 2017, um, those with orthotropia both at distance and near had better stereopsis than those with residual isotropia. So it's very important to make sure that the eyes are aligned once the spectacles are on because it was noted that patients with more than four prism diopters of deviation of isotropia at distance and more than five prism diopters of deviation at near had only gross to nil stereopsis. And for the refractive error, angle of deviation and fusional ability were associated with stereopsis in patients with refractive accommodative isotropia. And good isotropia is, was achievable with a misalignment of less than or equal to four prism diopters at distance and less than five um, prism diopters at near. So the target should always be orthophoric so that um, 
when we're running after the stereopsis, we can achieve at least an improvement in the stereopsis. So how do we gradually reduce hyperopia? Um, we have to take into consideration the amblyogenic age. So usually um, in, my, in my practice, I would usually reduce the hyperopic correction gradually at around 9 to 10 years old, around 0.5 to 75 prism diopters every 6 to 12 months, so that this will enhance or increase fusional divergence and maximize visual acuity. And in one study by Lambert, um, the spectacles were weaned out by 0.5, were weaned out by um, gradually decreasing the amount of hyperopia by 0.5 diopters increments until spectacles were discontinued or they developed isotropia, asynopia, or decrease in vision. So that's your, your, your cutoff. You need to, why, when you're weaning out the, the, the hyperopic correction, you have to make sure that there's still no isotropia, asynopia, or decreased vision because once this happens, then you have to stop from there. And the degree of baseline hyperopia appears to be one of the best predictors. So 91% of the patients, less than three diopters of hyperopia were successfully weaned out. However, when the grade was much higher, more than three diopters, only 22% of the patients were successfully weaned out. So what, when we wean off the spectacles, majority of the children, even after the second decade of life, require a spectacle correction and factors associated with lower likelihood of spectacle discontinuation were prematurity and greater hyperopia. And in this study, the rate of spectacle discontinuation was around 8% after 5 years, 20% after 10 years, and 37% after 20 years. And when do we do surgery? Again, our, our goal is to to align the eye with the spectacle correction. However, if there is a residual isotropia, then the patient can undergo surgery. Or if the eye already has decompensated from a previously controlled deviation. So as a take home message, we should not delay when we manage refractive accommodative isotropia because we are running out of time. We do not want to lose that fusional ability. We do not want that patient to develop amblyopia or if ever amblyopia is there, we want to correct it right away. And we do not want the child to further lose the stereopsis. So here are my references and thank you very much.